Good morning. So good to see you. 
Great to have you here on this uh, Palm Sunday. We've come here to worship the Lord. Hey guys, if you could turn the house lights down a little bit, we can see the, the screens a little better. I will tell of your wonders. I will sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always. Amen? Stand with me. Your mercy is mighty. Age after age, all generations will bow down in praise. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always. Sing His praise. I believe you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there are wonders and signs, and you're still the same. I believe every word that you said. I believe there are scars in your hands. And your goodness is good without end. Sunday. It's the first day of Passion Week, and there's lots of drama that's going on this week in God's Word. The triumphal entry today, the trial, the Last Supper, 
the crucifixion, the resurrection. It's a big week. And not only that, but there's in this week, the Bible records some very uh, heart-rending prayers that Jesus prayed. And also some prophetic prophecies that are so important. The book of John has 21 chapters. Eight of those chapters are dedicated to just this week, this Passion Week. It's a big deal for humans. Amen? It means a lot. Thank you, Lord. Let's ask him um, to be with us today. Lord, as we journey with your son in this week of remembrance and hope, help us. Help us to understand your love for the world and how deep it goes. Transform us into your likeness. Give us a faith that not only knows and comprehends the facts about the gospel of your son, but also trusts in the person and the work of Jesus alone for our salvation. Thank you, Lord. Prepare us for your service, your service in your kingdom through Jesus, our Lord. Amen. That day when Jesus came riding in on the donkey, people, all women, uh, boys, men, all children, uh, waving their cloaks, laying their cloaks on the ground and waving palm branches. We're going to reenact that today with our kids as we sing and worship the Lord. everyone clapped their hands raised their voices and sang to the Lord and then later we did not and so in this week last week of Lent we come before our holy God the King of Kings the whole world worships him one day and we come before him with confessional prayer pray this together with me Jesus our Lord we shout hosannas to praise you with eager hands, we place our cloaks and palms at the path before you. Yet, Lord, 
We confess that the mouths that seek to praise you often deny or defy you. And we confess that the hands that seek to serve you often become fists. Lord, hear us as we confess. Just before him now, lift a prayer. together we say these words from Matthew and John and Ephesians words of assurance that God has done the work for us we'll say together Hosanna to the son of David blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord for Christ came into the world not to condemn the world but that the world through him should be saved and therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Hosanna. Amen. Amen. You came to the world you created, trading your crown for a cross. You willingly died, your innocent life paid. your status as nothing the king of all kings came to serve washing my feet covering me with your love if more of you needs less of me take it
seated. Amen. Woo, I'm stirred up to, to worship King Jesus, aren't you, this morning? Come on. Oh, that's that. Let's try that again. Are you excited to worship Jesus this morning? Yes, yes, we are. Amen. Yes, thank you. All right. <laughs> Well, my name's Dana. I'm the Connections Director here. I'm so glad you're here worshiping us with us this morning. If you are a guest, bulletin in your hand, and right on the bottom here it says Connect Card. If you've been hanging out with us or maybe you've uh, been watching online, you guys can fill that out for me and uh, stop by the Connect Desk as you leave today. We have a free gift for you. I just want to make sure that you are seen and loved, and I just want to say hello to you, so please fill it out this morning. Now listen, you guys, we had a great uh, day yesterday here. We were filled up with kids and families for our Easter extravaganza. It was amazing. Thank you to all the volunteers who helped make that happen. But guess what else happened this weekend? It snowed a lot. And um, I was a little bit kind of sad about that. So I thought, you know, it is spring, actually, in Michigan. So I thought we would just do a little trivia, a little spring trivia. Pump us up a little bit this morning. You guys ready? Got your thinking caps on? Okay. Our first question. How many peeps are sold yearly? Those are those marshmallowy candy things. How many? Anybody? I got candy up here for whoever wants to answer. Anybody? Oh, I heard it right here. 700 million. That's how many? Can you believe that? 700 million of those marshmallowy candies. Okay, next question. <laughs> What's the first day of spring? This is a trick question, I know, but you got to get my right answer, okay? So what is the first day of spring in the northern hemisphere? I heard something over here. It's March 20th. Woo! Oh, I almost made it. At least usually it's March 20th. All right, last question. What do we got? Next question. What country is home to the largest tulip festival in the world? Is it Japan? Did I hear something over here? Netherlands. Netherlands, that's right. Oh, almost. Perfect. Okay, don't put me on any uh, teams today. Okay, that was fun. That was fun. Um, if you pull out your, uh, your bulletin this morning, there's lots going on um, as we head into the, uh, Easter and spring. Obviously, this Friday is Good Friday, so if you guys haven't been to our Good Friday walk-through experience, you're going to want to be here. Anytime between 1 p.m. and 7, the doors will be open. You come on in, uh, bring your family. It's appropriate for the kids. It's a great time. It'll be right in here. You guys want to be here for Good Friday to celebrate. Obviously, Sunday is Easter Sunday. We'll celebrate the resurrection. Invite your neighbors, your friends. They might just say yes, you guys. Take the chance. There's lots of invites as you leave today, so invite your family next Sunday to worship with us. As we head into spring, um, obviously Alpha's coming up starting April 3rd, Wednesday nights here. Um, listen, if you are like, I'm not really sure how to like tell my friends about Jesus, I feel kind of awkward, don't really know how to do this really well, this might actually be a really good opportunity for you guys to come to Alpha because you'll learn how to do that. So bring your friends who want to hear more about Jesus, and then you can learn about how to do that at work or at school or whatnot. So join us for Alpha. And if you guys can't make it to the first one on the third, come to the next, come to any one of those dates. It's open to come anytime. So join us for Alpha on Wednesday nights. Uh, the women's tea is coming up on April 13th. Ladies, we're going to have a great time together that day. I'm excited because I get to, hi, Dana gets to bring you the word of God that day. I'm so excited to share with you just, um, just the deep love of Jesus that comes right out of scripture that day. So if you guys could get signed up, bring your daughters, your nieces, all the way down to age eight, I believe. So uh, we're going to learn how to do tea etiquette. It's going to be so fun. So get your girls signed up for our tea. You can also see on here we've got National Day of Prayer coming, our CDC Garden Day. We get to serve in Detroit. So many wonderful things coming up. Sign up to be part of one of these opportunities. Um, we want to serve Jesus. Amen? Okay. If you'd like to give this morning, you can do so easily by going to our app or our website. There's, there's also our giving boxes in the gathering space as you leave. I want to get us into the Word of God. So if I could have James come on up, let's go. Good morning. Is it on? Okay. Good morning, Trinity. Uh, my name is James O'Hanlon. Uh, we have, my family and I have been coming here for three years. I have my wife, Andrea, Amelia, Juliana, and Thomas here. Um, we are in a life group uh, that meets every other week, as well as 
We, uh, my wife and I serve in Awana as well. I am one of the Sparks uh, Boys leaders. Today's scripture reading is going to be Genesis 35, uh, verses 1 through 7, 16 through 20, and 27 through 29. Then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods that you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Then they set out, and the terror of God fell on the towns all around them so that no one pursued them. Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is, Bethel, in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar, and he called the place El Bethel, because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Then they moved on from Bethel, and while they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in her childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't despair, for you have another son. And she breathed her last, for she was dying. She named her son Ben-Ani, but her father named him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar, and to this day, the pillar marks Rachel's tomb. Jacob came home to his father Isaac and Mamre near Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived 180 years, then he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of years, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. This is the word of the Lord. Speak of God. Thank you, James. Well, good morning. My name is Mark, and uh, I have the privilege to be in one of your pastors. It's great to see a full house today. If I haven't met you yet, I'd love to after the service. So stick around and uh, introduce yourself. I just I enjoy getting to know people from the church and uh, hanging out with you guys. We're gonna we're gonna jump into the last week of a series on the life of Jacob from the Old Testament. Before we do that, I want to pray. And then I must tell you a little story that helps us to get into the frame of mind of what's going on in Jacob's life. So let's pray together, if you wouldn't mind. Just bow your heads and uh, join me. Father, it's a privilege just to open your word today, to study your word. We understand these words uh, come from you. They are inspired by you. They're profitable for teaching and reproof and correction and training in righteousness. And so help us today by your Holy Spirit to uh, be thoroughly equipped for each of those things. And ultimately, to come to a deeper knowledge of you, a deeper love for you, a deeper relationship with you. And so it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, 2021, Denise and I were able to go to Guantanamo Bay to visit the U.S. Naval Base there because that's where our son was stationed. Uh, Caleb was a dentist there. He'd been there for a year. It's always hot. It's beautiful. It's a Caribbean island. And, and, and so we went, and one day we wanted to go out on the bay, and the bay is this beautiful water. It's the Caribbean, so you're, it's uh, blue-green. It's really clear. The water's probably 25 feet deep, just super fun. And so I'm, I'm like, Caleb, you're a, you're a lieutenant in the United States Navy. Surely you can get us a boat and captain the boat, right? And he's like, yeah, we can do that. And so we rented a pontoon boat and we went out onto the water and we started to go out to go snorkeling and, and we took the boat out, uh, out of the bay toward the mouth of where the Caribbean is in front of us. You've got one side of the base on one side of the water, one side on the other. It's uh, over a mile across, just gorgeous. And uh, as we're going, uh, we saw a sign on the, on the side that was huge. You couldn't miss it unless you're purposefully trying to ignore it. The sign's up on the screen. The sign uh, said um, to us, cable crossing, do not anchor. And I'm like, Caleb, what's going on? And he said, well, they, you know, several years ago, they, they took uh, all the electricity, the fiber optic, and I think even the water cables, and they put them across the bay from one side of the base to the other. And they just don't want you to put your anchor down because if you cut that, it would be bad. 
And I'm like, I was an electrical engineer, but I don't have to be a genius to realize that if I were to accidentally cut a cable that's carrying enough electrical current to light up both sides of a United States naval base, that would be bad. This is the definition of bad if you cut that. And even if you succeed somehow in staying alive, it turns out the Navy has a really nice residential facility that they keep people in and uh, you would never be heard from again. And so we thought, well, let's not do that. So we took the boat several hundred yards beyond where the cable was because we wanted to drop anchor and snorkel by Girl Scout Beach. And so we dropped the anchor in the sand and we got out and we put all our snorkel stuff on and we began to just explore. I don't know how many of you like to snorkel, but we love it. And, and you, the water was so clear. You could see the coral and the beauty of that. And you see all the different colors of the fish. We saw octopus and, and all sorts of different things. And we were probably at this for a half an hour. And, and we're just going and we're just enjoying ourselves. And I, I looked up at one point and I looked back uh, to where the boat was and I realized there's no way we swam this far. And, and it dawned on me that the boat somehow had moved quite a bit and it was moving in the direction of the cable. And so I managed to, to uh, signal Caleb and I look at it and so he's freaking out, I'm freaking out, we're swimming for all we're worth. And we get back to the place where the boat was, where we anchored it, and we realize immediately what happened. Because um, as the boat is being pulled by the wind and the boat's pulling the anchor and the anchor's getting closer and closer to the cable that's going across Guantanamo Bay that feeds all of the power to both sides of the naval base, like we just dropped the anchor into the sand. That's all there was. And, and the wind was pulling it and you could see in the bottom of the ocean, you could see a long line that went on for several hundred yards that was pretty deep where our, where our anchor is just dragging along, just having fun in the sand and, and is getting closer and closer to the cable. And we're swimming as fast as we can to get to our boat. And I'll tell you what happens uh, in a second. What happens to us. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you may not have had anything like that happen in your life, but here's what I know, is that story uh, will resonate with you in lots of different senses, especially in the sense that oftentimes in our life, we, we have this idea of, of just drifting. We understand that, that we can drift in our lives. When we let go of, of stuff and we just kind of coast along and, and, and drift along, we almost never drift to good places. It's really unusual for us just to drift along in life and, all, and, and we drift to goodness and life and vitality and health. We, it just doesn't work that way. When we take our hands off, when we're not investing in important relationships, we're not, we're not being purposeful about things in our marriage, it doesn't get better. One of the best ways to make your marriage worse is just don't do anything. Don't, don't invest in your marriage. If you're a parent and you're not investing in your kids, not spending time with your kids, your relationship with them is going to get worse. I've never known anybody, including myself, who's just drifted into good physical fitness. <laughs> I've tried. I mean, I've tried for years. <laughs> hey, my family's laughing too hard here. <laughs> I've, never, I've never known anybody that just woke up one day and they're like, what? how did all these A's get on my report card? I, I don't study. It doesn't work that way in life. It doesn't work that way in our relationships, not in our marriage, not in our parenting, not in any way. And it doesn't work that way in our relationship with God either. I know that's true. If you, if you, if you think to yourself, I, I, I don't know anybody here who's ever woken up after 20 years of not investing in their relationship with God, not spending any time with God, not building into that, and they think to themselves after 20 years of drifting, man, I'm so close to God. That isn't the way it works in our life. We need to invest in that relationship with God. Uh, D.A. Carson, he's a great writer, thinker, uh, theologian. Here's what he writes about drifting and our relationship with God. He says this, and see if this fits in your experience. He says, people do not drift toward holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, it's a great phrase, we'll unpack that a little bit, People do not gravitate toward godliness, prayer, obedience to Scripture, faith, or delight in the Lord. We drift towards compromise. We call it tolerance. We drift towards disobedience and call it freedom. We drift towards superstition and call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control. We call it relaxation. We slouch toward prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we have escaped legalism. 
we slide toward godliness and convince ourselves we've been liberated. That hurts a little bit, but it seems true, doesn't it? Um, Here's what he's saying. If you're not intentional about the way that you walk with God, what ends up happening is not that you find yourself in a place of fullness and joy and vitality in your walk with God, but actually you'll find yourself drifting toward danger. And so if you're not a follower of Jesus today and you're here, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. This, this helps you to understand what's going on in your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, that will also, this, this idea will help you to understand what may be going on with you in this moment where you feel at times like you're drifting. The author of Hebrews in the New Testament writes something to the early followers of Jesus along these same exact lines. He says this in Hebrews 2. He says, therefore, we must pay close, a much closer attention to what we have heard. In other words, you have been called by Jesus. You've been called to worship the God of the universe. You've been called into relationship with him. You've been given so much. It's an incredible invitation. But you've got to keep paying attention. Why? Lest we drift away from it. He says, if you don't do anything you're going to end up in a bad place. You've never, you're going to find yourself at some moment if you're just drifting and not paying attention. When you've taken your hands off the wheel, you find yourself, that dr- you find that drift is your default. And drift is oftentimes our default. It's what happens when we do nothing. And so the reason I want to talk to you about Jacob today is we find ourselves in Jacob's life, in Jacob's story, as we get to the last week. We see a guy who's, who's lived almost 4,000 years ago. He's this ancient dude, but he has so much that he experiences that we resonate with. And along the way in this whole series, time and time again, I've had people say, I'm, I, I, just, I never thought about Jacob as being somebody I could connect with, but I, I connect with him so many different times. But we see a guy who's been drifting, we see a guy who has had all sorts of different things in his life go on in a, in a good way with God, but he's really at the end of the last chapter where we left him in end of ter- chapter 34, he's in a bad place. He's in this place of drifting. I had people at the end of the service last week and throughout the week say, dads especially, they're saying, I, I really don't like Jacob anymore because of who, what he did. And we'll, we'll say that in a second. But, um, but God pulls him back. God pulls him back from that dark place, from that place of drifting, from that place of passivity, and he grabs hold of him. And he doesn't do it by slapping him upside the head. He doesn't take a giant beam and just whack him. He pulls him back. He invites him. He's gentle with him. He embraces him. So if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to Genesis 35, maybe on your your phones, or you bring a copy with you. We'll have words up on the screen. But Jacob is this person we've been following now for 11 weeks, and, and just in a nutshell, even when he's born, he's a twin and inside his, mo- his mom, it says he's grasping his brother. He's trying to pull his brother back. He wants to be the firstborn. He wants to be the one in support. And he wants to be the one in control. He's, his name, Jacob, means deceiver, usurper, the one who's always trying to get ahead. And he acts that way throughout his life. It, right, early on, one of the first stories we see about him is he's tricking his brother. He's stealing his brother's birthright. His brother gets so angry at him that he wants to kill him. So he leaves. And for 20 years, we, we've been following his life. And it's up and it's down. And sometimes he's, he's doing great and he's being faithful to God. Sometimes he's faithless. And yet all along, God keeps promising him, you're my guy. I'm... I'm going to work through you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a a large family. I'm going to grow a nation out of you, not because you're awesome, but because I promise you that's what I'm going to do. And sometimes Jacob responds to that, and other times he slips back, and it seems like he forgets that God's even there. But in chapter 34, we come to kind of the the bottom point for him because he is so passive. He is so uh, inactive that his, his own daughter is raped and he doesn't do anything about it. His sons come back and they're like, Dad, what are you doing? And, and they take matters into their own hands and they wipe out a whole town. And at the end, there's this interaction. And if, at the end of chapter 34, if this is the end of Jacob's story, it would feel like this is a super bummer because the boys say to Jacob, 
what were you doing? Why didn't you do anything? Are, are we just supposed to let them treat our sister like a prostitute? And Jacob's only response is, yeah, but you guys really got me in trouble because all the people around it are going to be angry at me now. It's passive. He's drifted. He's in a really low place. So God's going to draw him back. When, when Caleb and I were swimming toward that boat, and, and the boat is, it seems like, moving farther and farther away, and it is, sw- it is moving toward danger, and it's dragging the anchor in the bottom of the ocean. Uh, what we found was that a, a coral shelf that stuck to the foundation of the, of the ocean grabbed hold of the anchor and held it and got stuck there before it could get to the cable and cause a lot of danger. <laughs> Caleb had to swim down uh, 20 feet down below and, and release the anchor. We got, it was safe, everything is good. But here's the thing. I'm convinced that what God does to Jacob is kind of like that anchor. He's the anchor grabbing, or he's the coral grabbing hold of that anchor. And he's pulling Jacob back and into safety. And, and I want to look at that, how he does that with you in chapter 35. And so look at verse 1 with me. And along the way, when he's doing this, this, this idea of, of, of turning um, and, and uh, giving his heart back to God, it's fun how this happens. Look how it unfolds. He says, um, verse, verse 1, God said to Jacob, Arise and go to Bethel. Settle there. Build an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So here's, here's what's going on. We didn't make a big deal about the geography, but what actually has happened is that God had told Jacob to go to Bethel, and, and he, he went part way. He's living up with his uncle, and he's doing some stuff, and God says, I want you to go back to Bethel, and, and what Jacob did was he went part way, and he settles in Shechem. And that's where all the bad stuff was happening this week because Jacob was content there. He was happy. He was just drifting along. He, you can imagine him sitting on the front porch of his, his condo there just drinking his Arnold Palmer and saying, hey, life is good. I got this. No worries. I don't need to trust in God anymore. And, and God's breaking in. His word is breaking in and saying, Jacob, no, you need to go all the way. You need to go back to the place where you promised you would go, the place called Bethel. And here's why that's important. Because Bethel is the place where 20 years ago, I met you. I appeared to you. Bethel means the house of God. I was there with you. There was the stairway to heaven. Remember, Jimmy Page's guitar was playing. You heard all that stuff. And it, God was, I was there with you. I promised you that no matter where you go on the face of the earth, your steps will, st- will walk in places where I am blessing. Because I have called you and your family, and I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you great. I've made you all those promises, and the biggest of those promises is I will be present with you. That's why it's named Bethel, the house of God. You would be with me in my house. And so when you were going back, you were supposed to go back to that place. I wanted you to be in the place of my presence, and you stopped short. And so God appears to him. God says to him, I want you to keep going. And he doesn't yell at him. He doesn't get angry at him. He doesn't call him an idiot. He doesn't try to shame him. He doesn't try and whack him on the head. He doesn't smite him. Great Old Testament word. He just says, keep going. It's this wake-up call. A wake-up call that says you've been drifting. You've experienced the consequences of drifting. And they have been a disaster. I want you to keep going with me to a place of my presence, of my grace, of my blessing. God speaks to him. God invites him back into his presence. Arise and go to Bethel. No matter what's going on in your life, I want you to be with me. Our big idea, I'm just going to wrestle with this for a little bit in the next verses, and our big idea, our sermon and sentence, if you will, is this idea that, that actually is helpful in our relationships with one another, in our jobs, our parenting, school, whatever, and getting in shape. This idea of a return to vitality with God begins with a rejection of passivity and an embrace of intentionality. If we're trying to get in shape, we've got to not be passive, be intentional. Our relationship with our wives, our parenting, whatever. But here's what I want to focus today because this is where the, the story of Jacob takes us. In our relationship with God, 
in our vitality with God, we'll just naturally drift, drifting as our default. But he's going to call us back to have a vital relationship with him. And that means not being passive, but embracing intentionality. And so maybe you're here today and you would say, in my heart of hearts, I'm already feeling like there's some conviction going on because I feel like I've been drifting. I feel like I I don't know where I'm headed. I'm looking down the road 20 years in my lucid moments and I'm thinking, I don't want to keep going down that road. The stuff that I'm doing, the, the life that I'm living, I don't want to end up there. Maybe you're coming and you feel like I've, I've grown cold in my relationship with God or I've, there's dark areas of my life that I just, I know that's not right and I want to not do that. Maybe I'm neglecting something. I don't know where you're at today, but I think this is going to be helpful for us. Because with Jacob as our guide, I want to show you how three words that were helpful for him, that I'll just, words to remember, that helped him as he's moving out of passivity, embracing intentionality. And I don't want you to think, and this is where I, I just, hear me well in this, because oftentimes it can come across in churches, uh, in our walk with God, it can come across that if I'm, if I'm not doing well, I need to try harder. I need to keep, like, read more Bible, pray more, and, and try harder to, to get here with this relationship with God. And you try that, and it doesn't work, and so you're coming back, and you try it, and you try it, and come back, and and eventually you give up because you just feel like, I can't do it. It just feels hopeless to me. And and my message to you is that that's not the approach that God gives us. The approach that God gives us, you could call it an approach of grace, but it's an approach that is not about more effort. And so I want to prove that to you as we go along. The first word that Jacob kind of grasps, he doesn't use the word, but it's, it's a biblical concept. If we want to have a vital relationship with God, and we find ourselves drifting right now, the first word is the word repent. The word repent. Look at what that means for him. Verse, this chapter 35, verse 2 and 4. Look at what it says. It says, Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him. This is right after God spoke. God said, go back to Bethel. You've been drifting. I want you back in my presence. He says, the first thing he did, he went to his household. Everybody was with him. And he said, get rid of the foreign gods that you have with you. And purify yourselves and change your clothes. And so verse 4, they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Did you do double take when you read that passage? Like I did? I'm reading through there. I'm thinking, wait, wait a second. Are you saying to me that for 20 years now, through all that God has done for him, all, that God, all the ways God has blessed him, God has given him a family, God has given him so many children, God has given him uh, crops and, and flocks and all the wealth that you can imagine, God has blessed him, and yet all that time, he's had other gods. We think, well, where'd they come from? See, we heard about these gods, remember if you were with us, back with Rachel. Rachel stole the gods from her dad, and then when dad was looking for them, Rachel's his wife, Rachel hid them under a camel's saddle, and you wonder, well, whatever happened to them? Well, it turns out for years, they've been thinking to themselves, you know what? Yahweh God is awesome, and we worship him, but we just want to hedge our bets. We're going to carry these other gods along with us. We're going to carry these other gods in case we need a different answer than the answer that this God's given us. And at this moment where they've been drifting and they've realized the consequences of the drifting, God says, come back to me. And Jacob's response is a response that acknowledges, I have seriously messed up. And so he tells his family, we need to get rid of all those gods. We are done with them. We turn our back on them. We're walking away from them. We are finished with those gods. And so he tells the family, all right, give me all the gods and give me all your earrings, which is kind of weird. We're having an earring collection at the end of the service and at the back. Um, they don't know exactly why. Earrings must have had some sort of religious significance to them, but they get all the earrings and they, they take them and they, I wish it would say that they destroyed them. It says they buried them. We don't ever hear from them again, but I think, man, that would be too much temptation. If, they, if I know where I buried them, they'd be right there, right? But he buries those and he says, we are cutting ties with those gods. Because one of the principles that he's gonna, he teaches us in this action 
It's a principle for you and it's a principle for me is you cannot hold on to idols and chase God at the same time. We can't do it. We talked a few weeks ago about idolatry and and what that looks like in our life when we talked about the story of Rachel. But he's finally realizing I can't have it both ways. I can't hold on to my sin. I can't hold on to the other gods and trusting in them and chase after God at the same time. But that is so much our temptation, isn't it? Don't we oftentimes, even when we're following Jesus, think to ourselves, I want both and. I want to hold on to my sin. I want to hold on to my pride. I want to hold on to pursuing pleasure and power and anything else that uh, that I want to do. But I I also want Jesus. And the the lesson from Jacob in this moment is a definitive, clean break. He says, I am your God. Those other things are not. Put them away. Bury them. Be done with them. Cut ties with them. There's a confessional element in this repentance that he's acknowledging he did wrong. He's acknowledging before God, I messed up. And as he does that, um, it says also that you're to put on new clothes. Again, you're like, what was that all about? Paul picks up on that imagery in Ephesians when he says to, when we become a Christian, we take off the old clothes and we put on the new clothes of righteousness. That's where he, this is where he gets that language. This idea of a clean break, we're going to be different people. And it's a beautiful thing. I think sometimes the word repentance and repent scares us because we think, I remember seeing that guy standing on the corner and he had this big sign and it says, repent or go to hell. Repent, you rotten so-and-sos. And they're just angry about that. But repentance in the Bible is actually a really beautiful word. It's a beautiful concept. It's this idea that no matter where I am, no matter where I have been, no matter how much I've drifted, no matter how much I've on purpose or accidentally or apathetically walked away from God and I'm sitting in this place of darkness and I'm sitting in this place of of, of badness and unhealth, no matter where I am in that, God's always inviting me to turn from that and to come back from him. And there's never a limit on how many times he invites us. He's always inviting us. When I see the word repent or the concept of repentance in the Bible, I ought to just like high five myself. I'd be like, thank you, Jesus, that you allow a person, even like me, even like, like especially you guys, no, especially me, to repent. He gives us those chances again and again. He's always there. And the Bible says in this beautiful verse, uh, 1 John 1, 9, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love that, that, that Jesus is always there at the ready, cleansing us, making us free and forgiving us when we turn to him and when we repent. That's the first thing that Jacob does. So before I leave this idea, I want to challenge you a little bit. I want to to dare you to pray a prayer. Praying is dangerous because God hears prayers and he answers prayers. Some prayers are really dangerous. And I, I I want you to consider praying this prayer that comes from the Psalms. Psalm 139. David prays this prayer and he models it for us. And I wonder if you might pray this prayer. It says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And one of the things that's awesome about David and his prayer is he's, he's admitting, God, you know what? There's the things I know I did wrong. There's the things I know I've drifted away, the ways that I know I've been apathetic towards you or anti-you. But then there's also stuff I don't even know about. The unknown unknowns, the unkunks in Jokari, Jokari, Jokari window kind of thing, if you know that one. I don't even know. And God, I want you, I pray this, I want you to open up my mind, open up my heart to know where I've had areas of my life that I've walked away from you. That's a dangerous prayer because God will answer that prayer because God wants to cleanse us and give us wholeness and health. This is intentionality. This is repentance. He continues on and he says, see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David is going back to God and he's saying, God, I need you. I need you to guide this life. I'm, I've messed it up. I, I need you to steer it. So I want to repent from things that are not true, things that are not of you, things that are not honoring to you. Arise and go to Bethel. The second word that 
that Jacob gives us is this word remember, this idea of remembering. So repent, remember. Uh, it's a crucial step, remembering both what God has done and who God has made him to be, remembering his identity. Uh, several verses read right in chapter 35 that all talk about what God has done. Look at verse 4. Look at several up on the screen. Uh, verse 4, it says, or 3, it says, Then come, let us go to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God. Why? That's who answered me. He's the God who answered. This is what God has done in the day of my distress. Who has been with me? God has answered me. God has been with me. Verse 7, he built an altar. He called the place El Bethel because that's where God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing with his brother. God is the answerer, the be with her, the revealer. Verse 14, Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked to him. God is active in his life. And he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it, and he called the place where God had talked with him. He's remembering that. He called it Bethel. That, that pillar of stone, it's the Hebrew word Ebenezer. There's a song that we sometimes sing in church called Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And in that song, there's a place where it says, now I raise my Ebenezer. And it's not a beer mug. Like, I don't know what you think it is, but it's a remembering stone. It's this idea that God says, I want you to remember all the things that I've done. And here's the awesome thing about remembering stones, because they use those all the time. A remembering stone was not Jacob piling up a bunch of stones and saying, look, this is the place where I was so awesome. This is the place where I really nailed it with God. I want you to know, kids, whenever you see this, this is where Pop really was shining. This is for my grandkids and, and people in the neighborhood. This is where I really was obedient to God. This is what this is for. That's never what it was for. The whole idea was this was the place where God did something in my life. This is the place where God was faithful. This is the place where I was messed up and God called me back to my, himself. This is the place where I was fearful and God gave me courage. This is the place where God of the universe, who knows me and knows exactly all the bad stuff about me, still loved me enough to move in my behalf. That's what an Ebenezer is, this stone. It's a place of remembrance. And that's so important for you, and it's so important for me. When we end up a bit drifty, a, a bit kind of wandering off, uh, what do we do? We first repent, we, we name those things, and we say, God, I want to not do that anymore. I want to, by your glory, not do that. And the second thing is we remember. We remember what God did. And you say, well, what's God done for me? Well, it just so happens, like today is Palm Sunday, and, and I know it, you thought, I'm just in a zoo up here, but this is actually a reminder, these things, and the kids come. It's a reminder that Jesus came into Jerusalem the week before he would be crucified to give his life for us. It's a reminder of that. He did that for you. Once a month, on the first Sunday of the month, we celebrate communion. Communion is a meal that's done to remember that Jesus died on the cross for you, to take your sin away from you, the judgment of death to take it off of you and to give you life. Those are reminders that we build into the very fabric of our church calendar. But then very personally, I, I remind myself, and I have, to, I have to do this all the time because I'm so prone to forget. I'm so prone to wander, just like you. And I have to remind myself, this is what God has done in my life. He has, he has called me uh, from a job where I was enjoying it to be a pastor, a, a, a shepherd, to do something that's different, that's outside of my comfort zone. You have no idea how much it gets uncomfortable sometimes. He's called me to that, and I love it. He's given me a, I wake up in the morning. I wake up this morning next to an awesome wife. He's given me this bride that is way uh, out, of, out of my league. Like, I don't deserve her. He's given it. He gives me life and breath, and we remind ourselves, right? What has God done for us? So much. And if God's done all that for me, it reminds me to come back to him. It's a pull back. It's the sense of a, a reminder stone that God has never left me. God is always there. The other thing that is he's, re, he's reminded of, though, is his identity. There's a, a verse that it seems kind of weird. If you were reading through this and you've been with us the last couple of weeks, it seems like deja vu all over again. Because verse 9, it says, in the midst of all this, God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram. This is way back when he was with his uncle Laban. He's living way up in the north of, of what's now Israel, and, and he's living there. And it says, he appeared to him again now. 
And he blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. If you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, you're like, wait a second, that already happened. Why is he doing this again? Didn't, didn't, in chapter 32, didn't God say to him, look, your name is, what, what's your name, dude? And, and Jacob's like, it's Jacob, deceiver, usurper, uh, get ahead one. And, and God says, yep, you named that, uh, but your name is now no longer Jacob. Your name is Israel. You have wrestled with God and you have overcome. You're no longer Jacob, you're Israel. And then we go through two more chapters and Jacob acts a whole lot like a Jacob. He's still tricking and he's still usurping and he's still passive and he's drifting away from God. And so God in this moment, this wake up call says to Jacob again, your name is Jacob, but it's not Jacob anymore. Remember, it's Israel you might wake up this morning and you felt like there's a lot of Jacob in you, but you're actually Israel. You're acting a lot like Jacob, but you're Israel. He's not angry with him. He doesn't beat him over the head with it. Again, he, he, called, he just reminds him, this is who you are. I have redefined you. I have renamed you. You are not the deceiver. You may act like that, but that doesn't define you. I'm calling you to something better, to something greater, to something more whole, to something more healthy, to something more vital. I'm calling you to my presence. I've called you Israel. You're no longer Jacob. And again, when we're going through times of drifting, we're going through times where we are just kind of on our own, to remember who God has called us to be is so vital. Because when we are living like a Jacob... Jesus says to us, no, you are my child. There's an awesome passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that's, that's, I think, really helpful. Paul says this, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. She is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. See, we just look at our lives and we think, but it doesn't feel like that. It feels like there's still a lot of old in me. There's still a lot of me in me. There's still a lot of mark in here, and it's not growing fast enough. And so we can, if we're not careful, we default back to think our behavior is what is identifying us. And if I mess up, then I must be a mess up. If I screw up here, I must be a real screw up. If I sin in this, I must be a sinner, and that must be how I'm identified with, by God. But the reality is, even when we're over here, even when we're in this drifty place, in this bad place, Our identity is in Christ. He's the one who's called us his children. He's the one who never lets us go. He's the one who, by his grace, always forgives us and calls us back and says, you are a Christian, a Christian, a little Jesus. You're made in my image. He gives us that identity. Don't fool yourself into thinking this is who I am because this is who I am. And he's calling me into that. He's given me invitations into that all the time. But I have to remember, this is who he's called me to be. This is what a Jesus follower lives like and looks like. I'm not there. Let me grow me, God. Help me in this. I repent. Forgive me. And I come to you and I realize, man, God, you've done so much. I want to be in you, in your presence. We repent. We remember And the last word is recommit. And I'll just hang with you for just a second. Um, Again, this is unexpected. Verse 13, God went up from him in that place where he had spoken with him. And then Jacob set up this pillar. Jacob actually acts. He sets up this pillar in the place where God had spoken to him, this pillar of stone. He realizes, you know what? Coasting is natural. (laughs) My default is drifting. But in this moment where God has given me a wake-up call, he's given me a second chance, maybe it's a 40th chance. I'm going to make this the moment I say no to the other gods. Make this the moment where I remember all that God has done in my life. Remember who God has called me to be. I am Israel. I am not Jacob. And then it calls for action on his part. He recommits. And 
And the awesome thing is, in this moment, Jacob is not basing his recommitment on how awesome he is. I finally got it right, and so I'm going to recommit based on that. He is recommitting based on the promise of God in his life. God has been faithful. No matter how flaky Jacob has been, God has been faithful. No matter how distracted, how much he's drifted, any of those things that, God, that Jacob has done, God has been good. God has been faithful. And he bases his recommitment on that promise of what God has done. He's like, God, you have beckoned me home. You have invited me into a way of repentance. You've reminded me of who you are. You've reminded me of who I am. You've reminded me of, reminded me of what you've done in my life. Through every generation, your steadfast love has been good and has been true. And he bases his recommitment on that promise that God will always be there. Again, I don't base my recommitment on a regular basis to God on this idea that I'm just going to try harder and, and make it all based on me. We do it because we know God is faithful and God is good and God is a rock. God is that coral shelf on the bottom of, of Guantanamo Bay that just grabs our anchor when we're about to be drifted off into danger. And he says, no, I want to protect you. I want to hold you. I want to keep you. So I invite you, as the worship team comes, I invite you to close your eyes with me. I'm not going to make anybody or ask anybody even to raise a hand or or say anything out loud, but I just want to maybe uh, process some stuff with you about this sermon, about this passage, and then we'll pray. Because maybe um, you've come in here and you would say, if you were to have a conversation that was really honest with me or with somebody, you might say, man, I, I came in here on fumes. <laughs> And uh, maybe, there, maybe there's some area of your life that you just feel like God's put a finger on that thing today. And I'll, I'll just confess to you, I've been praying all week that he would do that. <laughs> Not that you'd feel bad, but that you would feel invited to life. Maybe you're here for the first time or first time in a long time and you're not sure about Jesus. And I just want to tell you that pathway to a vitality with God, that's possible. It is good. My encouragement is that you would trust in the Savior who loves you and who gave his life for you. You would repent of going your own way and that you would believe in the one who gives life, the one who is the rock. And if they're here, you're here and you're, you've wandered, you've drifted, and it looks different for you in different areas, I just pray that you would embrace the invitation to return to vitality with God this morning by repenting and remembering and recommitting your life. That invitation is open to you today. And so let's pray. Father, uh, this morning, that's our posture. Our prayer is that in this place, we would hear your voice in a fresh way. Maybe you would use this wake-up call of, of Jacob's life to catalyze us out of complacency. We don't want to drift. We don't we know that drifting doesn't take us anywhere good. We want to intentionally follow after your heart and your way. And so, Lord, we turn from the things that we've embraced that aren't of you. We remember that regardless of the way that we've acted, that your name over us is saved, redeemed, holy, new, saint. We are no longer a sinner. And Lord, it's our desire to build our lives and stand on your beautiful promises. And so it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and still in a spirit of prayer, confess to the Lord.
That's such a great prayer, such a great song that illustrates a prayer and, and cries our heart out to God. I pray that that would stick in your head all day long. Uh, come next week to the Easter service. Invite friends, invite family. It's going to be some great music, a great celebration of the resurrection. As you go today, I want to give you a blessing. Uh, if you want to raise your hands, lift your hearts, eyes, and hear these words. <laughs> mm. Drifters, <laughs> arise and go to Bethel, the presence of the Lord and drop anchor on the rock that will hold forever. Amen and amen. Have a great week, you guys. Thank you, team. Scenes of mountain grandeur Creation's majesty, the glory of the sunrise shining over me. With the single greatest wonder my soul has ever seen is the Lamb of God on Calvary. Blazing stars that reach me from distant galaxies The oceans they are speaking, magnificent so deep Still the greatest wonder my soul has